Marcus Tullius Cicero, in defense of Sextus Roscius of Ameria, translated by Michael Grant, part 6, narrated by Max Layton. In private business, if a man showed even the slightest carelessness in his execution of trust, I say nothing about culpable mismanagement for his own interests or profit, our ancestors considered that he had behaved badly, very dishonourably indeed. In such cases a trial for breach of trust was held, and conviction on such a charge was believed to be every bit as shameful as conviction as an offence for s such as theft. This no doubt was because when there's a matter we can't take part in ourselves, we are obliged to rely upon the good faith of a friend instead of our own personal endeavours. That being so, anyone who betrays such a commission attacks a safeguard which is designed to serve the whole community, insofar as it rests with himself to do so. He is undermining the entire basis of our social system. For we can't do everything for ourselves. A man has his own sphere of useful activity and can't go beyond it. This is precisely why friendships are formed, so that joint interests can be promoted by mutual services. It's quite wrong to accept a trust at all if you propose either to neglect it or to turn it to your own advantage. Don't offer to help me and then thwart and impede my interests while you are pretending to do me a service. Get out of the way, and I can find someone else to act for me instead. You may genuinely imagine that you are strong enough characters to carry the burden, but only the very strongest characters will really be able to take such things in their stride. That's why a breach of trust is a disgraceful offence, for it destroys two things that are truly sacred, friendship and good faith. A man normally entrusts a commission only to a friend and only entrusts it to someone he believes to be reliable. Only the most degraded characters then would take an action calculated both to destroy a friendship and to damage a man who is suffering this damage because you were the person he trusted. Isn't that so? Since, therefore, even in quite a minor matter, failure to attend to, to trust incurs a legal sentence carrying the maximum degree of disgrace, a case as grave as the present one, in which a man entrusted unreservedly with the good name of a dead father and the fortunes of a living son has brought disgrace upon the dead and destitution upon the living, makes it impossible to think of him any longer, not merely as a man of honour, but as a man who has any place among human beings at all. If all were done as it should be, the man who entrusts someone with a commission should be able to afford to relax and to be negligent, but never the man who accepts it. And that's why, even in private affairs of no importance, the merest carelessness in administering trust is made the subject of a charge which carries a sentence involving utter degradation. In the present case, on the other hand, we are speaking of a trust of the utmost importance, arranged and commissioned by a public authority. Here we have an individual who has not just injured some private citizen by his carelessness, but his treacherous behaviour has violated and defiled the sacred character of an official delegation. It would be impossible to overstate the severity of the sentence and punishment which ought to be inflicted upon such a man. If Sextus Roscius, as a private person, had commissioned Capito to negotiate and arrange this business with Chrysogonus, granting him the discretion to pledge Sextus's word, and if Capito, having accepted the commission, had derived even the very smallest personal profit from its performance, he would surely have been liable to conviction by an arbitrator, who would have compelled him to make restitution by depriving him of every shred of his reputation within the bargain. What actually happened, however, was not merely that Capito received a commission from Sextus Roscius, there was also something much more serious. For on this occasion you might go so far as to say that what was entrusted officially to Capito's care by the town council was Sextus Roscius himself, and everything that concerned him, his good name, his life, and his entire property, all at one and the same time. And it's not just a question of Capito converting some trifle or other to his own advantage. On the contrary, he has totally bereft Sextus Roscius of everything he's possessed, and as his own share he settled for three of the farms. 
and for the wishes of his town council and fellow citizens, he showed as little regard as he showed for his own oath. Take a look at the rest of his actions as well, judges, and you'll see that he's contrived to defile himself with every single kind of villainy you can possibly imagine. Consider, for example, his deception of the other envoys. Even in such trifling matters, it's considered a very shameful thing to deceive one's partner, every bit as shameful as the breaches of trust I was speaking about just a moment ago. And it's justly regarded, sir, because a man who enters a partnership with another is entitled to believe that he has enlisted someone who will help. Where on earth will he find good faith if he's not been able to find it in his own chosen associates? Besides, the offence which deserves the severest punishment is this which are held in the highest regard against my apologies. Besides, the offences which deserve the severest punishment are those which are the highest to guard against. In our dealings with strangers, we can be reserved, but our intimate associates cannot fail to know how a great deal more about us than any mere acquaintance does, and against one's own partner. Therefore, it is quite impossible to take effective precautions. Even to feel nervous about his integrity almost seems like a breach of obligation in itself. How right, then, our ancestors were to maintain that a man who has deceived his partner could no longer be entitled to a place in decent society. Yet what Capito did was a good deal worse than just cheating one single financial partner. Even that would have been extremely serious an offence, but still we have managed to find it just endurable. But he had to do had, but he had to do with no less than nine men, excellent men, his fellow envoys on the deputation, appointed in pursuance of the same mandate and commission as his own, and he ensnared the whole lot of them leaving them completely in the lurch, depositing them at the right hands of their enemies, trapping them with every imaginable kind of treacherous fraud. Not the slightest suspicion of his criminal purpose was likely to cross their minds. He had been made their partner in an official duty. To mistrust him would have seemed entirely wrong. They quite failed to see what an evil man he was. They believed his empty words, and in cons consequence, it's because of his sinister machinations that these good men now find themselves censured for displaying insufficient caution and foresight. Whereas he, on the other hand, the individual who turned traitor and went over to the other side, the creature who first revealed to his associates, revealed his associates' plans to their enemies and then joined the enemy ranks himself, still continues to overwhelm us with menaces and intimidations. And in the meantime, he has become richer by three farms the rewards for his abominable action. His whole life, gentlemen, has been one endless series of iniquities. This disgraceful deed that we are now discussing is only one of them. May I venture to suggest the principle upon which your inquiry should be conducted? If you come upon someone with a general record of greedy, violent, depraved and treacherous behaviour, you will also invariably find that some actual crime is lurking within its midst. However, in the present case, lurking might not be the right word, since, in fact, the crime is openly manifest and exposed to view. This being the case, we don't need to go through the process of merely inferring the criminal act from Capito's deplorable past record. The contrary is the case. If anyone chose to query this or that item on the record in question, we could infer from the existence of the crime. So we can hardly say, can we, gentlemen, that a master gladiator, Capito, has retired from his cutthroat profession just quite yet. However, it would be equally hard to maintain that his pupil here, Magnus, is only in the slightest degree inferior to him in skill. The one is as greedy and infamous as the other. The outrages are well matched, and in respect of violence there is nothing to choose between them. Well, you heard about the trustworthiness of the master. Now you must learn about the pupil, and see what you think about his standards of behaviour. As I mentioned before, our opponents have repeatedly been requested to hand over two slaves for examination. But you, Magnus, have always rejected this proposal. One must conclude, I suppose, that you considered the applicants unworthy of a positive answer, that the man on whose behalf the application was made failed to engage your sympathy, that the request itself is, in your opinion, unjustified. And yet the people who asked you of this, 
this of you. People whose names I mentioned earlier on are blessed with as fine a positions and characters as anyone in the entire country. Their way of living is so honourable and their reputation to Rome so great that no one would ever question the fairness of anything they said. The man for whom they were acting has suffered such an unparalleled series of horrible misfortunes that he would be perfectly prepared to offer up his own body for examination by torture, provided only he could be quite sure that the death of his father would be properly investigated. Yet you, Magnus, have not allowed even the slaves to be examined, and your rejection of this request seems to me nothing less than a plain confession that you yourself were guilty of the crime. But it really does seem quite extraordinary that you should have uh, had the nerve to turn the application down. When Sextus Roscius was murdered, the slaves were on the spot. As for them, I neither say that they were guilty nor innocent, but your opposition to the demand that they should be examined is remarkably suspicious. This outstanding consideration they are receiving at your hand shows clearly that, shows clearly that they know something which would ruin you if it were disclosed. You object that it is forbidden to examine slaves for evidence against their masters, but in the present case that would not be the situation. Since the defendant is Sextus Roscius, such an examination for him would not be directed against their master at all. You yourselves declare that you are their masters. Now, actually, you will say, what are they with Chrysogonus? So we to suppose that Chrysogonus is charmed by their learning and their accomplishments and he has particularly chosen these labourers trained by a rustic householder at Ameria, which is more or less what they are, to associate with his own array of charming, civilised young men, handsome, picked from the most elegant homes. No, gentlemen, that can't be the answer. Chrysogonus is most unlikely to have been captivated by the literary ability of the culture of these slaves, and he is equally unlikely to have thought that they would provide industrious and reliable managers of his household affairs, we are not being told the whole truth, and yet all these endeavours to keep the master out of sight and mind only that the effect of making it all the more blatant and conspicuous. The next question which might seem to arise is whether the person who is so reluctant to allow the slaves to be questioned may not be Chrysogonus himself because he wants to conceal his own crime, but that gentleman goes beyond what I am choosing to assert. One must not be indiscriminate in distributing one's accusations. On this particular subject, I, personally, entertain no suspicions whatsoever concerning Chrysogonus. And th th at this point I have always intended to make. You will remember that at the beginning of my speech, I divided the case into two parts. The presentation of a charge, a task which was left entirely to Erucius, and the act of violence, which is the role of Magnus and Capito, so that, they have, so that any misdeed or crime or murder that can be discovered will have to be placed at their doors. As regards Chrysogonus, as regards to Chrysogonus, what we contend is that his excessive influence and power are obstructing our case to an intolerable extent, and we request that you, gentlemen, since this lies within your power, should not only cut this power down to the sides, but should attack it with the full retribution of the law. My view is simply this: the person who is eager to that known witnesses of a murder should be examined is presumably trying to get at the truth. But the man who refuses such an appeal is manifestly confessing his guilt, even if he doesn't venture to admit it in so many words. Gentlemen, when I begin this part of my speech dealing with Magnus and Capito, I declare that I didn't want to say one single word more about their criminal deed than it requires, and the exigencies of my defence demand. For the amount of evidence that could be brought forward to prove their guilt is enormous, and each separate piece of evidence could be supported by a mass of varied arguments. If I dealt with every one of these questions, I should be doing so unwillingly and of necessity, and in such circumstances I wouldn't feel able to give them prolonged and detailed attention they require. But still there remain some points that couldn't possibly be passed over in silence, and those gentlemen I have touched upon, though not in detail. If once I began to deal with all the other pieces of evidence, those which are matters of suspicion, justifiable suspicion, I should have to speak at great length, and so instead I prefer to leave them to your intelligent conjectures.